Grade 7 ELA Lesson 1. This week's lesson, you will be asked to analyze two poems in order to determine how the authors convey their messages about consumerism. Part of your analysis will involve looking at poetry form. Let's start with a portion of a level up tutorial from collections to help us understand what poetry form is. In this tutorial, you will learn to understand the basics of poetry, speaker and form, to distinguish between traditional and free verse poetry, to identify sound devices in poetry, to identify imagery and figurative language in poetry. When you hear the word poetry, do you think of flowery words and sing-song rhymes? Do you think of your favorite songs? Poetry is a type of literature in which words are chosen and arranged in specific ways to create an effect. Poems come in many different types, styles, and forms. Some poems tell stories, while others express emotions or paint pictures in words. Just as a story has a narrator, a poem has a speaker, the voice that talks to the reader. It's important to remember that the speaker and the poet are not necessarily the same. Who is the speaker in this example? The teacher's face falls. Wrong answer. A slow burn creeps, turning pink and red, crawling up my neck, fanning out over my cheeks. I look down and pretend to study the name carved into my desk. Who is the speaker in this example? Is it a teacher or a student? If you selected student, you're correct. The speaker of this poem is a student who has just given the wrong answer in class. The words I and my let you know that it's the speaker who blushes and looks down. Form refers to the way a poem is laid out on the page. Unlike prose, in which sentences follow one after another in paragraphs, poetry is divided into lines and stanzas. Stanzas are groups of lines. The place where a line ends is called a line break. The end of a line of poetry does not always signal the end of a sentence or thought. Often, poets will continue a sentence or thought across several lines. Click the image to analyze the form of a poem. Ask yourself, how many lines and stanzas does this poem have? Where does each thought begin and end? It was July and the sun toasted the emerald grass until it smelled of warmth and green and life. It was July and my heart soaked up the airy warmth until it sang of joy and love and life. You have learned about the pieces that make up a poem, lines and stanzas. Now read the poem again using what you have learned to answer a question about its form. Which is a correct description of this poem's form? It was July and the sun toasted the emerald grass until it smelled of warmth and green and life. It was July and my heart soaked up the airy warmth until it sang of joy and love and life. Which is the correct description of this poem's form? It has two stanzas and eight sentences. It has eight stanzas. It has eight lines and two stanzas. Or it has eight lines and no stanzas. Take a moment to think about your response. If you select it, it has eight lines and two stanzas, you're correct. This poem has eight lines divided into two groups or stanzas of four lines each. One thing you will notice about poetry is that it comes in all kinds of different forms. Some poems follow strict rules about lines, stanzas, rhythm, and rhyme. These are called traditional poems. Some traditional types of poetry you might know are ballads, sonnets, and limericks. Other poems have no recognizable patterns or rules. Their lines do not rhyme in any regular way and might not even be similar lengths. These poems are called free verse poems. Traditional or conventional poems follow rules for lines, stanzas, rhythm, and rhyme. For example, a sonnet must always have 14 lines and use a particular pattern of rhyme. Ballads, odes, and other traditional forms have different rules. In many traditional forms, the rhyme, beat, and structure repeat regularly throughout the poem. For instance, if the first stanza contains five lines, so might the other stanzas. Usually, 
Traditional poems have a rhyme scheme or pattern of rhyme that repeats across the different stanzas. To identify a traditional poem, ask yourself: Do the lines, stanzas, rhyme, and beat in this poem follow patterns? Tr While traditional poems follow rules, free verse poems break them. Free verse poems do not contain regular patterns of rhythm and rhyme. In free verse poems, lines and stanzas may be of varying lengths. The poet lets ideas rather than a set of numbers of lines or stanzas dictate how a free verse poem looks on the page. This type of poetry is often described as sounding like everyday speech. Click the image to read a free verse poem. Pay attention to the irregular line breaks. Also. Notice how the poet uses rhyming words without creating a pattern. The bell rings. With a roar, the doors fly open down the halls. Tile squeaks under a hundred sneakers. The music between classes. You have learned about the characteristics of and the differences between traditional and free verse poetry. Now practice what you've learned. Drag each characteristic of poetry into its correct box: traditional or free verse. Let's look at the first characteristic. It includes ballads, limericks, and sonnets. Would this be an example of something in traditional poetry or something in free verse poetry? Take a moment to think about your response. If you select a traditional, you're correct. These three forms are types of traditional poetry. How about the next one? Has regular patterns of rhythm and rhyme. Would that be traditional or free verse? If you pick traditional, again you are correct. These are characteristics of traditional poetry. And how about this last one? Sounds like everyday speech. Is that traditional or free verse? If you selected free verse, you are correct. Free verse poetry is often written to sound like everyday speech. You might remember the difference between traditional and free verse poetry by telling yourself that free verse is free of rules and patterns. Read each poem. Is it free verse or traditional? Day and night I pluck the strings while my backup singer sings. We'll be famous. Wait and see. One day we'll rock out on TV. Is that free verse or traditional? If you select traditional, you're correct. These lines have patterns of length, rhyme, and beat, so they are probably from a traditional poem. How about the next one? Looking out my window, I see a towering mass of cloud, a kingdom of air, reaching to heaven, an optimism and hope. Is that free verse or traditional? If you select a free verse, you are correct. This poem does not have a regular rhyme scheme, nor does it have regular beat. When read aloud, the poem sounds like everyday speech. Sound devices are techniques used to give poetry a musical quality. Both traditional and free verse poetry often contain sound devices. Click each sound device to learn more. For our purposes in this lesson, we're going to focus just on rhyme and rhythm. Starting with rhyme. Rhyme refers to the repetition of sounds at the end of words, as in night and fright. There are several kinds of rhyme. End rhyme, the rhyming of words at the ends of lines. Internal rhyme, the rhyming of words within a line. And slant rhyme, words have similar but not identical sounds. When end rhyme has a pattern, it is called a rhyme scheme. Rhythm is the musical quality produced by the repetition of stressed and unstressed syllables. A regular pattern of rhythm is called meter. Both free verse and traditional poetry use rhythm. However, free verse poetry does not have meter. As you have learned, rhythm is the beat of a poem, the sound created by repeating stressed and unstressed syllables. A stressed syllable is one that is emphasized. For example, in the word student, the syllable stu is stressed, while dent is unstressed. When the rhythm is regular and repeats throughout the poem, it is called meter. Poets create meter by arranging words to form patterns of stressed and unstressed syllables.
Click the images to see examples of meter. Roses are red, violets are blue. Explanation. In this example, one stressed syllable is followed by two unstressed syllables. Come dance with me. Tonight, my dear, forget your cares. Forget your fear. Explanation. In this example, one unstressed syllable is followed by one stressed syllable. As you now know, meter is a regular repetition of stressed and unstressed syllables. Remember that a poem can have rhythm without having meter. Reading lines aloud can help you hear the pattern of beats. Decide whether each example demonstrates meter. And they walked at a pace that would make your heart race. Does that have meter? Yes or no? If you selected yes, you're correct. These lines have a regular pattern of two unstressed syllables followed by one stressed syllable. How about the next one? The grass waves like a yellow green sea tossed by the wind. Is there meter in that? stanza. If you selected no, you're correct. The sequence of stressed and unstressed syllables in these lines follows no particular pattern. Let's look at the final one. The fields lay smooth and white and crisp with snow. Does this have meter? If you selected yes, you're correct. In these lines, the meter consists of one unstressed syllable followed by one stressed syllable. Now that we've had a refresher on poetry form, let's look at the poems for this week's lesson. Listen as they are read aloud and think about what you just learned about rhythm and rhyme. We'll start with Dump. Dump by XJ Kennedy. The brink over which we pour odd items we can't find enough cubic inches to store, in-house, in mind, is come to by a clamor up steep unsteady heights of beds without a dreamer and lamps that no hand lights. Here lie discarded hopes that hard facts had to rout, umbrellas, naked spokes, by wind jerked inside out, roof shingles bought on sale that rotted on their roof, Paintings eternally stale that hung remained aloof. Pink dolls with foreheads crushed, eyes petrified in sleep. We cast off with a crash what gives us pain to keep. As we turn now to return to our lightened living room, the acrid smell of trash arises like perfume. Maneuvering steep stairs of bed springs to our car, we stumble on home canned pears grown poisonous in their jar. And nearly gash an ankle against a shard of glass, our emptiness may rankle, but soon it too will pass. Did you hear the rhythm and the rhyme scheme? This poem has a traditional form which uses stanzas made up of four lines that follow the ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme, meaning that every other line rhymes. There's also a clear meter, which is the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables in each line. If you want to get really smart, we can notice that this rhythm is something known as iambic trimeter. That means it has six syllables that follow a pattern of stressed, unstressed, known as an iam. Da-da, da-da, da-da. Look at specifically in the third stanza here. Here lie discarded hopes that hard facts had to rout. Umbrellas naked spokes by wind jerked inside out. You may have noticed some variation in the rhythm and even a couple of the rhymes, and that's okay. Poets have some degree of flexibility even when using a traditional form, but the majority of the poem is consistent in terms of rhythm and rhyme, which makes it traditional. Now let's listen to How Things Work by Gary Soto. Think about how this form is different from Dump. How Things Work by Gary Soto. Today, it's going to cost us $20 to live, five for a softball, four for a book, 
a handful of ones for coffee and two sweet rolls. Bus fare, rosin for your mother's violin. We're completing our task. The tip I left for the waitress filters down like rain. Wetting the new roots of a child. Perhaps a belligerent cat that won't let go of a bald sock until there's chicken to eat. As far as I can tell, daughter, it works like this. You buy bread from a grocery, a bag of apples from a fruit stand, and what coins are passed on helps others buy pencils, glue, tickets to a movie in which laughter is thrown into their faces. If we buy a goldfish, someone tries on a hat. If we buy crayons, someone walks home with a broom. A tip, a small purchase here and there, and things just keep going, I guess. Did you hear a clear rhythm or rhyme scheme? Hopefully not, because it's not there. This is written in free verse form. Free verse is written to sound a little more like natural speech. However, the poet does make intentional choices about where to break their lines, what punctuation to use, and whether or how they will use rhyme and rhythm in each line. Looking at these choices can help us better understand the messages the poet wants to convey. Now that we have reviewed form and peeked at the poems for this week's lesson, it's your turn to look more deeply at the form and the messages each poet conveys about consumerism. You will use this analysis to complete the comparing two poems chart. Notice that the chart does ask you specifics about the form and also some things about word choice and language. All of this will lead you to the poet's message about consumeristic society. Be sure to give some text examples that support what you believe that message might be. Good luck and happy analyzing. Hello, and welcome to the week of May 18th for ELA 7GT. This video segment will help you with lesson two of this week's lessons, in which you are asked to create an organizer or a visual representation of the power relationships discussed in your research on the Russian Revolution. One example of the type of representation that you could do is something called a sociogram, which is what we will explore within this segment. So what is a sociogram? A sociogram is a visual representation of power relationships. It can be used to represent real people, or it could be used to represent characters within a text, as long as there are individuals and groups that show some sort of power relationship, you can use a sociogram to demonstrate that. For this lesson, you're sort of asked to do both. The primary focus is the historical figures and groups from your research on the Russian Revolution. However, we know that we can connect a lot of those people and groups to characters in Animal Farm. So what you should try to focus on is making those connections as you are also representing those historical figures. We're going to take a look at an example of a sociogram within this video segment. So for this model, I will use the story of Cinderella. If you're unfamiliar with the story or if it's been a really long time since you've thought about it, I'll give you a quick review. So Cinderella lives with her stepmother and her two stepsisters who treat her horribly. They basically treat her just like a servant. She spends whatever free time she has sitting by the fireplace among the ashes and cinders, hence the name Cinderella. One day, the king invites all eligible young ladies to a ball in hopes of finding a bride for the prince. Cinderella desperately wants to go, but her stepmother will not allow it. Instead, Cinderella is forced to help her stepsisters get ready and watches in sadness as they go off to the ball without her. Cinderella's fairy godmother then comes to the rescue and using her magic gives Cinderella everything she needs to go to the ball, including a pair of glass slippers but she warns Cinderella that the spell will wear off at midnight, so she must be home before then. Cinderella goes to the ball, dances with the prince, and they fall in love. The clock begins to strike midnight and Cinderella panics, so she runs off, leaving one glass slipper behind. The prince uses the slipper to search all over the kingdom to find this mystery girl. He eventually gets to Cinderella's house, the shoe fits, Everyone is happy, except maybe the stepmother and the stepsisters, and the prince and Cinderella get married, and they all live happily ever after. Again, except for maybe the stepmother and stepsisters. So there's the story of Cinderella recapped.
So now that we are re-familiarized with the story of Cinderella, let's take a look at a sample sociogram that could represent some of the power relationships within the story. For the sociogram of Cinderella, we will begin with the character of Cinderella, since she is the central character of the story. I chose a glass slipper to represent Cinderella because that is ultimately the major symbol for Cinderella. The first relationship that we will demonstrate is the one with her stepmother. I use some squiggly lines to represent the tumultuous relationship that she has with her stepmother. I also drew the stepmother a little below Cinderella, not completely below her because she does attempt to hold some power over Cinderella by bossing her around, but she doesn't hold all the power. Cinderella, despite the fact that her stepmother is so cruel to her, remains optimistic and happy and does what she is asked without complaint. So that hold shows that she holds a little power over her stepmother in that way. Underneath the stepmother, of course, are the stepsisters. Stepsisters are ultimately influenced by their mother. So they're going to go underneath of her and they are also represented with the squiggly line because their relationship with Cinderella is just as tumultuous as Cinderella's relationship with their mother. The next character is the fairy godmother. We're going to place the fairy godmother a little above Cinderella here because without the godmother's magic and her help, Cinderella would never have achieved her goal of meeting the prince, falling in love, and eventually becoming queen. The fairy godmother, I chose to draw a wand to represent her magical power. And then the last relationship on the sociogram is the one with the prince himself. We use hearts to show that they are in love or eventually fall in love. And I chose a crown to represent the prince because he's royalty. Notice I put the prince below Cinderella because again, she holds some more power over him than he holds over her. It is he who goes to seek her out when she runs away and disappears. And since she's a peasant and he technically is not allowed to marry her, he changes the rules of the kingdom for her. So that shows that she is a powerful enough character to completely alter the rules of a kingdom. And there you have an example of a sociogram for the story Cinderella. Notice how in that sample sociogram, symbols are used to represent the characters. In this case, the symbols represent who the characters are within the story. There are also symbols that are used to show those relationships and the placement of the characters is very important as well. All of this works together to demonstrate and illustrate the power relationships within the story. Here's another example of a sociogram for Cinderella. You will notice that this one uses clip art and symbols rather than having drawn everything out. And each of the symbols are a little deeper representation of the characters than the literal ones in the last example. It might be actually a little difficult to figure out which characters are being represented by these symbols unless you take a look at their meanings and explanations. We're going to go over some of these meanings and explanations, but first I want to point out that this sociogram was created with a little bit more detail and with a different version of Cinderella than the previous one. So there are going to be characters that are represented in this sociogram that were not seen in the last one. As we know, a lot of times stories have lots of different versions, and so this is just an example of a different version than what was given in the last. So you see, according to the chart, that that son in the middle is actually Cinderella. Uh, she's placed in the middle because she's the main character, and it is a son because all of the characters revolve around Cinderella. Plus, she's like a ray of sunshine, staying positive, even when faced with many unfair challenges. If you look at the connectors, you can see that her strongest relationships are with the animals who help her in her time of need and the prince who loves her unconditionally. The animals from the story, so this would be the, the Disney movie, if you're familiar with that. Um, she had mice who were her close friends and some other animals who helped her out. So if you see the person saving a drowning man, that's representing the animals in the story because they're the animals are the ones who help Cinderella when she's at her lowest. You can see their placement is close to her because they stick by her even when she is down. And they're also right next to her because she treats them as her equals. They have a strong arrow because they are giving toward her.
The godmother is the rabbit in the hat. And so that symbol is used because the fairy godmother is magical and she's hidden from view most of the time. The godmother is somewhat removed from Cinderella because she isn't always there for her. But she isn't too far away because she does help her when she needs it the most. So she's above Cinderella because she's a positive force in her life. And you can see she also has a strong arrow pointed towards Cinderella, um, but it isn't completely filled in. And that's because the godmother helps Cinderella a lot, uh, but she doesn't help her all the time. The rainbow is meant to represent the prince. So just as the sun shines through the rain to make a rainbow, Cinderella's love shines through her challenges towards the prince. The prince is close to Cinderella because they love each other and because he loves her even after he finds out that she's not a princess. He is above her because he's important to her. So notice here's a variation in the other sociogram where she, uh, this uses the prince in a way to show that um, he's important to Cinderella. And so that's why he is placed above her. Whereas in the last one, he was placed below because he did not hold as much power as she did in the relationship. So that's just an example of how no sociogram is going to be exactly the same. And it's all about your interpretation. Notice that the arrow is strong and pointed both ways as they both love each other. In this version of the story, the father is around. So the logs in the picture represent the father because he's like a bump on a log. He doesn't help Cinderella in her time of need. He's far away from Cinderella since he doesn't come to her aid. And that connector is a wavy line um, instead of an arrow because there's no love or giving between them and their connection is uncertain. The lightning cloud is the stepmother and she brings with her trouble that tries to cover Cinderella's sunshine. So knows that, that a lot of the symbols here are connected to the symbol of Cinderella. So there's a relationship between the symbols themselves in this example of a sociogram. Uh, for the stepmother, she's close to Cinderella because she, because she has quite an influence on her, but she's below her because she's a negative force in her life. The arrow is dotted and pointed toward the stepmother because Cinderella gives and gives and gives to her, but the stepmother does not give back. And finally, the flies on the picture represent the stepsisters. Flies bother people just like the stepsisters bother Cinderella. They feed off of her and are very similar to each other. You want to swat them. They're further away from Cinderella, but close to the stepmother because they're influenced greatly by the stepmother and follow her lead in terms of how they treat Cinderella. Like the stepmother, they are below her because they are a negative influence in her life. And then the arrow is also dotted just like the stepmother and pointed toward the stepsisters because Cinderella gives and gives and gives to them, but they do not give back. So even though those were two different examples and the pictures that were chosen were different and the connectors were different, you can see some similarities in those power relationships and then um, how those power relationships are illustrated through the sociogram. So now it's your turn. Think about those two examples that you saw, and you're going to use your notes to create some sort of organizer, like a sociogram or a visual representation that illustrates what you learned about power during the Russian Revolution. If possible, you're gonna make connections to the characters and events in Animal Farm. So think about those individuals and groups that were involved in the Russian Revolution, and then think about what we know about the characters in Animal Farm and see if you can make some connections and use those symbols and representations to create a sociogram to show those power relationships. Good luck and happy illustrating!